Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Morning. Good morning. How's, How's everybody? Oh, thanks for that thunderous response. So, uh, I'm just kidding. Good morning. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here. I am honored to serve under our senior pastors, Pastor Marcus and Natalie Avalos. That's Natalie right there. She's yelling it out. So, uh, Hey, I, you may have heard this. I announced it last week, but I'm going to announce it again because I'm pretty proud of myself. This is my seventh year here at Crossroads. Yeah, which if you know me is pretty miraculous. I'm a pastor's kid and I always vowed to never work at a church. But here I am, which I think is a testament to our amazing leaders here. Very open-handed leaders. They, they, what I love is they want the people that they serve to thrive. They want that for you guys. They want that for all of us. So I, man, I'm just grateful for you guys. So uh, if you're new to this church, you found a good place. You probably already noticed that. That's the reason you're here. You felt like maybe this is home. It is a home for you. It's like a family. That's the, 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 the culture and the environment we've got here. So you are welcome. We're going to continue our series this morning called, oh yes, it's my 19th, 17th, excuse me, anniversary to my wonderful wife, Emily. And uh, yes. You, you would think after 17 years, I'd know better. But in the first service, I asked her to come up here. That did not go well later for me. So I'm not going to have her stand, but she's right here on the front row. Beautiful lady. Uh, do you want to at least stand? No, you don't even want to stand. Okay. All right. So, uh, so here's, here's what I was thinking. This week, uh, you know, 17 years married. I was thinking to 18 years ago what life looked like for me. And I was remembered 18 years ago... Um, I was living in San Antonio, going to college at UTSA, and my dad was a pastor of a church in Corpus, and I went to visit my dad, and he had hired this, this new associate pastor who ran the college group as well, and I did not like this associate pastor that he hired. There was just something about him and me. We were like oil and water, and we just clashed. I, didn't, I don't know what it was about him. I didn't like the way he talked and the way he did things, and I just did not like it. And so I would kind of start poking fun at him. If you know me, I'm a pastor's kid. I don't, I'm just kind of irreverent to pastors. So I'd make fun of him. And one time he was given a message that I just, I didn't really get anything out of. So I just left, um, which is something I do that it gets me in a lot of trouble with my wife. Uh, if I get to a church and I just don't like what, I just don't feel like the pastor's making any effort to make it relevant to me, I just leave. Um, so yeah, feel free to do that if I don't do that today. But uh, uh <laughs> That said, I really, it, it, it really made me go, as a pastor kid, I'm like, I want to make sure that every message I share is really relevant and practical, and it's something that I've experienced. I've, I've listened to pastors share stuff that I'm like, eh, you're just saying that. You've never actually lived that or dealt with that, right? And so that's one of the beautiful things I have with Pastor Marcus. Sometimes he'll say, hey, here's this, this thing I want to talk about. And I'm like, actually, I think you're the better guy to talk about that because I'm still trying to figure it out, right? So I always try to make sure everything's relevant and practical. I've worked through it in my own life. So anyways, bottom line, I walked out. He did not like that. Felt very disrespected. And basically me and, me and this associate pastor, my dad's had a major clash all the time. And he just didn't like me and I didn't like him. Then one weekend I was in town and I met this amazing, beautiful girl. This woman, I mean, she was just incredible. Had a great personality. The thing that drew me to her, she had this amazing laugh and just an amazing laugh. And then I put together the math and realized it was that associate pastor's daughter. <laughs> and I realized I was in deep trouble because the woman I was falling in love with, her father hated me. I know, it's hard to believe. <laughs> Sweet, lovable me. The guy hated me. I was a jerk. I had been a jerk. So over the year, there's like this whole year of just conflict, 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 where I'm trying to figure out how do you honor the father and like, you know, honor your father and mother, right? Well, how do you honor your father-in-law and mother-in-law? And like, how do you do that when they hate you? It's very tricky. And I just think about that, that year. And, and here's the wild thing. Last week, I had a conversation with my, my father-in-law, just getting some advice from him. And I thought afterwards, I hung up the phone. I'm like, who would have thought 18 years ago that God could do such an amazing work that he and I are super close now? I think he loves me more than his own sons personally, but that's, don't tell them that. But anyway, uh, but you know, that's why I tell people all the time, they say, man, this is just, there's no way there's reconciliation. Trust me, I've seen it firsthand. God can reconcile and fix any relationship if you have a little humility. Amen. 
and that's what was hard. I actually had to go and humble myself before him and I had to apologize for things that honestly at the time, I didn't even really think I had done wrong. Now I realize I had been incredibly disrespectful, but it was in that humility and humbling myself that the relationship was reconciled. And now, I mean, it's an amazing thing, right? You know, you've heard of the three, the three rings of marriage. There's the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and then there's suffering. Um, <laughs> We had it in reverse order. We had all the suffering, then the engagement ring, then the wedding ring, and now it's been bliss ever since for 17 years. But uh, I'm just kidding about that. Of course, there's been tension. But here's, let me tell you, this is my, this is my, my premise this morning. Conflict isn't bad if the goal is to get to peace. In fact, in marriage, in any relationship, if you really want unity and peace, it's gonna come when you're willing to kind of have some conflict in a healthy way. But most of us don't like conflict. And I get it. I don't like conflict. I've just learned that the price of not engaging in conflict down the road is worse than the pain of right now. You're going to pay it now or you're going to pay it later. And it's usually easier to pay it now. And here's what I know about every one of you. In your life right now, you've got somebody in your life that you're in conflict with. Maybe it's the person you've been married to for years, but you feel like you're living your own separate lives You're under the same roof, but man, he's doing his thing. You're doing your thing. She's doing her thing. And you just like, you're walking on eggshells. You know, we don't touch this. We don't do this. And you're kind of going, why are we even together? Well, we're staying together for the kids. But you just, there is so much tension and resentment that's built up. And there's this conflict. And every time you start to talk, it just, you feel it flare up within you. And you go, I can't take this, right? You've got conflict there. Maybe some of you, it's with your own kid. Your kid's telling you they hate you and you're going, what happened here? I used to have this little baby in my arms and she looked up at me and just adored me and now she's saying she hates me. I didn't raise her to be like this. Where did this, where did things go wrong? Maybe some of you, it's your boss and you just, man, you're just dreading going to work tomorrow because you cannot stand that guy or that lady and you're just like this, I can't take it. Some of you, maybe it's your in-laws and you go, man, if my husband's mom got hit by a bus, life would improve vastly. I saw a meme the other day. It said this. It said, I'm so worried about my mother-in-law being deported. She lives at 206 such and such lane and she gets off work at four. We've all got people we've got conflict with. And, And here's my main point. If you walk away with nothing else this morning, here's my main point this morning. Your greatest opportunity for spiritual growth will tend to come through times of conflict and suffering. Isn't that encouraging? Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. I don't like that. I mean, I don't like that. In fact, there's this verse in Acts where it says, they went around encouraging the believers saying, through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. That is not a Hallmark card, y'all. Can you imagine if you were laying in the hospital and you got a card that said that? Through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. You're like, thanks a lot. Friends like you, who needs enemies, right? But the reality is there's this growth that happens through conflict and suffering. And if we'll get a new perspective on conflict and suffering, it can actually be the most, the quickest way to transformation in our lives. So the Apostle Paul, we've been reading his book to the Philippians, the people at Philippi, the book of Philippians is called the book of joy, which is totally ironic because he wrote the book while he was in a dirty Roman prison. But he's basically saying, guys, you can have joy no matter what the circumstances are because joy starts in here. It has nothing to do with what's going on out here. And we talked last week about how Paul says, guys, the point here of everything is people. People are the most important thing. And you show God that you love him by the way you love people. God says, hey, love God and love people, but you show that you love me by how you treat people. Now, it's easy to love a distant God off there, but it's real hard to love those people around you who are very obnoxious and irritating, isn't it? When the rubber hits the road, you get into marriage, you go, wait a second. She wants, she said she wanted the same thing as me. She changed. Which actually change is good in a marriage. If, some, if you're not married to somebody who's evolving and growing and getting changing, that's a bad thing, right? But, but here's, here's, here's the thing. So people are the point, but the greatest suffering in the world tends to come through people. And you know this because, man, some of you have faced hard medical challenges, but it's nothing compared to the conflict you're facing with your son or daughter or spouse. And I'll elaborate even more. Specifically, it comes from people who think they're right, which is you. 
fact, the Bible, it says every man's way seems right in his own eyes. You're absolutely right about everything you believe in your mind. If you weren't, you would have changed your mind, right? And what happens is your right comes up against somebody else's right and it turns into this huge battle. You're like, no, but I'm right, but I'm right. And, and some of you, man, we all, you know, because we think our way is right, we look at other people around us like, man, I'm just surrounded by idiots. All these people are idiots. And you know what they're thinking about you? Yeah. Same thing. So here, here I'll elaborate even more. The greatest suffering comes from people who think God is on their side or that they are God. If you look at last century, hundreds of millions of people died at the hands of communism, which in theory is a great idea, except humans get involved and mess it up. And there are so many communist countries that said, there's no God, the state is God. And the guy in charge gets to decide what's right and wrong. And hundreds of millions of people died because they made themselves God. Some of the biggest mistakes Christianity ever made. The Crusades, where they're like, God's on our side, so we can do whatever we want because God's on our side. Wrong, right? I heard a guy say, God didn't come down, to, Jesus didn't come down to take sides. He came down to take over. And there's so much conflict. And as we go into, a, as we go into a, an election season, if you haven't noticed, it seems like the tension is rising even more and more. You've probably got friends and, friends and family that you won't even talk to about politics because you're like, they get crazy when I start talking about it. If I start talking about this guy or that guy, man, they go nuts and it gets wild and crazy and I don't even want to talk about it. And the crazy thing is you have some of your friends and you're like, how can they even call themselves a Christian and believe that? I'm a Christian, but God's on my side and I believe the right thing. And we're going to talk about that. Like, what, is it, what, do you, what happens when you come to a situation where you're convinced God, you're on God's side on this, but they're also convinced God's on their side? What do you do in those situations? Conflict is everywhere. And this is where Paul, he steps up and he says this. He says, guys, last week he's, we talked about how he says, look, people are the point. The most important thing is to focus on people because that's how you show how you love God. So he says this, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In week one in Philippians, we talked about how Paul introduced uh, his letter and he said, hey, to all the saints who are at Philippi, and how many of us come from backgrounds where, where saints are people who are named saints after they do a bunch of good stuff. But really in, in the Bible, a saint is somebody who has accepted the gift of Christ. And when you've been forgiven because of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, God sees you as a saint. So you don't do good works to become a saint. You do good works because you already are a saint. That's a shift in perspective. You're not trying to earn God's approval. He's already given you his approval because of Jesus. And you're doing good works. You are a saint because, or you do good things because you're a saint. So he says, guys, live up to that. And I can't tell you how many people I've met who they get involved in a church and they get super engaged and then they leave. And I ask them, I said, why did you leave? And they say, well, they started judging me at that church. And I said, what do you mean they were judging you? And so many people say, well, they, they started calling out things I was doing. And I'm like, it, it, and I say, you know, it doesn't sound like they were judging you. It sounds like they were calling you to greatness in yourself that you couldn't even see. They saw you were better than what you were doing, better than the way you were living. You had more potential in you and what you were doing was short-circuiting, limiting your potential and they were calling greatness out of you, but you got afraid because it was gonna take some work and you ran and you called it being judged. But really, it was them calling you to live up to the manner of life worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whenever I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I was thinking about that phrase this week. I was like, what does faith of the gospel mean? And I think, this is my take on it. I think it means standing firm, believing that this stuff God says works and is true, even if it doesn't seem like it in the short term. Believing faith is believing, man, even if it doesn't look like, I believe that what God says is true and doing what he says is true and living by what he says is true, even if it costs me in the short term, in the long run, I'm gonna be grateful for it. It's that eternal perspective we've talked about. He says, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. And that's from God. For it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Isn't it fascinating that he starts talking about relationships and then he ends by talking about suffering. What I think he's saying here is when you're engaged in any relationships with anybody, 
there is going to be conflict because you're convinced you're right and they're convinced they're right. And how we manage conflict is one of the best ways that we can show that our hope is in God. And many of us, we run from conflict, but we're not called to run from conflict. We're actually called to engage in what's helpful to bring and live at peace with those around us. So Paul in Romans, he talks about this. He says, look, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is a great, I mean, the Bible's real, right? It deals with real situations. He's saying, if it's possible, there are gonna be some situations you're never gonna get closure on and never gonna get reconciliation on because the people on the other side don't want it. But you can have peace in the eyes of God and in your own heart if you've done your best to humble yourself and come and apologize, make peace as best as you can. They may not want it, but if you've done your best to seek peace, then you're in the right standing there says, but there's going to be times it's just not possible. But if it's possible, live at peace with everyone. And don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. We live in a time right now where everybody says they want peace, but really what they want is for you to do what they say. The whole cancel culture is about this. We believe the right thing. You don't believe the right thing. In fact, your belief is so bad. We're not even gonna listen to you. We're not even gonna let you talk because you don't even deserve a seat at the table because we're the good people and you're the bad people. Let me tell you, that's not peace, okay? Tyranny brings peace by removing any dissenting voices. Tyrants, they say, oh, there's peace in my country. Everybody, we got 97% vote for me. But everybody that didn't vote for me, I killed. It's peace. That's not peace. That's tyranny. And how many people, I meet so many people, men that say, man, we had a great marriage for 30 years and then she just up and left. And when you do a post-mortem on the marriage, you find out that what happened is for 30 years, she just, she'd try and speak up and he'd shut her down. And sometimes he'd say, well, I'm the head of the house. God told me I'm the man. You need to listen and submit. 30 years in, finally, she's like, I'm not mad. I'm just leaving. I can't take it anymore. Because that's not peace. It's peace to the guy. He got what he wanted all the time but it's living under constant tyranny. That's not peace. Unity brings peace by struggling through our disagreements. Saying, I know you came from this background and I came from this background and you've got something I can learn from and I've got something you can learn from. So we're just gonna wrestle through this and I'm not gonna run. I'm not gonna hide. I'm not gonna crush you. And this is one of the challenges too. We live in a world too right now where it's the truth bomb and walk away. I told them the truth. You ever seen these things? Um, uh, Facebook or on uh, YouTube, it'll say, this guy scorched this person and then walked away with the truth. And you're like, that's, that, listen, that's not godly, okay? Because you may vanquish your foe and conquer the enemy, but people that have been beaten don't usually like to hang out with the people that beat them. You may conquer them and say, this is the absolute truth. And they surrender and back away. And you're like, I won the battle, but you probably lost the war because the goal is unity and relationship. It's not to be right. Bill Wilcox was saying there's an Air Force uh, flyer that says it is uh, just kind of a warning for people that fly bomber planes. It says, it's not wise to eject from your plane over an area you've just bombed. <laughs> because the people that you just bombed, they are not going to like it. So that's why it's important. You've got to use minimum necessary force. When you go into a conflict, you say, what's the minimum amount of force that's necessary for me to present what I need, but also leave them some room for them to present what they need so that we can come to unity. Because the goal is unity. The goal is not to be right. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we ignore truth. Truth should absolutely be at the center of that. But there's a lot of disagreement over what is true. And there's a lot of things in the Bible that are super clear, but there's a lot of things in the Bible that aren't super clear, but we put our preferences over it and say, this is what the Bible says. And we're like, eh, does it really say that? And a lot of times it's just our preferences. And so many things we've gone to war over with other people are just our preferences, but we've labeled it as God, this is what God wants. Moshe Dayan, he was an Israeli uh, um, war hero. He said this, he said, if you want to make peace, you don't talk to your friends, you talk to your enemies. How many of us, when we have a conflict with somebody, who do we first go to? We run to our friends and be like, did you know what they did to me? And your friends are like, oh, that's wrong. You know what he did to me? And then you start stirring up all this dissension. That goes nowhere. If you truly want peace, you've got to be willing to engage with the very people you think don't even deserve to get to talk to you. You've got to go to those people that you see as your enemies. And that's really hard. 
because it's acknowledging their humanity. It's acknowledging that there's somebody God loves, somebody God values. It's also acknowledging that you may be wrong and you may not have a corner on the truth, which is a scary thing. G.K. Chesterton, he's my favorite author. One of, he said this, and I love it. He says, men don't differ much about what things they'll call evil. They differ enormously about what evils they will call excusable. Yeah, that's good. How many of us, you go, man, how could they possibly believe that way and be a Christian? That's evil what they believe in. And they're looking at you and going, how could they possibly be a Christian and support that guy? He's evil. And we look at all the evils and like, well, my evil is excusable, but yours is inexcusable. And yet all of us are wrong in some way. That's why Jesus said, before you go and confront, make sure you get the log out of your own eye before you go after the speck in your buddy's eye. And if we'll look at ourselves and realize, man, there's some things I tolerate in my life that I probably shouldn't tolerate. I know they're way worse than me. They're worse than my thing, but really, are they? You have to look humbly at yourself. Here's another quote by G.K. Chesterton I thought was brilliant. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I loved it so much because he's my favorite author. I thought I'd share it with you. He says, the men whom the people ought to choose to represent them are too busy to take the jobs, but politicians are right there waiting for it. The politician is the pestilence of modern times. What we should try and do is make politics as local as possible. Keep the politicians near enough to kick them. The villagers who met under the village tree could also hang their politicians to the tree. It's terrible to contemplate how few politicians are hanged today. Anyway, G.K. Chesterton, love that dude. Funny quote, I like it. So here's, here's the challenge of it. Many of us run from conflict because we're like, oh, conflict can't be godly. Conflict is just conflict. It's how we respond and how we handle the conflict that makes it godly or ungodly. And so many of us run from things we need to confront. And oftentimes we attack things we need to back off and be humble on. So Paul says this, uh, it's a fascinating verse. He's talking about the suffering that we all face in this life. And you know, the greatest suffering comes from conflict. And he says this, he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. This verse always bothered me because I was like, wait a second, what's lacking in Christ's sacrifice? Like Christ, what he did on the cross was perfect. If it wasn't perfect, we're all doomed. What does he mean by I fill up what's lacking? And I read something by a guy named John Piper, who's an author I love, a speaker I love. And he, he explained that verse this way. And I think it's brilliant. I put it up here, the exact quote, so you could read it. What's missing is the in-person presentation of Christ's sufferings to the people for whom he died. The afflictions are lacking in the sense that they're not seen and known among the nations. They must be carried by ministers of the gospel. And those ministers of the gospel fill up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ by extending them to others. Paul sees his own suffering as the visible reenactment of the suffering of Christ so that they will see Christ's love for them. Jesus' life was filled with conflict and it was filled with the ultimate suffering. And what Paul's saying is when you choose to engage in the suffering of conflict and working out, bringing peace and unity, you're actually giving an example of who Jesus was and what he did. Christ Make no doubt, he was right. But what he sought more than anything was reconciliation with us. And he came down and he loved us right where we were. And that's a really important thing to realize. Man, we're all on our own journey. We're all growing. And so many times we get mad at people because we're like, well, they should be further along in this area. And they're looking at you and going, well, you should be further along in this area. And what we have to do is we have to seek unity and trust that, man, as we, as we, we come around a central idea and seek unity over that, that's where peace comes from. And it may mean we have to let a little bit of our being right down for the sake of that unity. But that's where the cross comes in. Jesus on the cross, he reconciled our relationship vertically and he reconciled, because of that, we can reconcile our relationships with people around us horizontally. But at the crux, at the center of it all is Jesus and the cross. And that's the thing we can rally around. The idea that, man, apart from Jesus, we are all in deep trouble. And the beautiful thing about the church is, man, everybody, we all come under one roof and we've all got different beliefs. The people sitting next to you, if you were getting into a conversation with them and here's some of the stuff they believe, you'd go, those people are crazy. And they'd say the same thing about you. 
But you know what we rally around? No matter what our political affiliation, no matter what our belief, we rally around this. And when we have disagreements about political things, disagreements about how the house should be run, we make sure that Christ stays at the center of it. Say, man, I completely don't agree with you on the way we should spend the money. But I'm going to make sure that we seek unity on this. And that means you're going to have to give up a little bit on your end. And they're going to have to give up a little their end. And you get a little bit closer. And through Christ, that's where the reconciliation comes. But it takes humility on your part, which is where that beautiful verse I mentioned right after worship comes in. Who being in very nature with God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus was God on earth. But it said he humbled himself. And he humbled himself even unto death. And sometimes giving up on what you just know is absolutely right. It can feel like death because your whole identity relies on you being right. Men, that's us. I'm right, woman. Maybe you're right. Or maybe you just have a very narrow perspective and maybe you need to humble yourself and trust that God also has some things he wants to show you through your spouse if you humble yourself. Just like Jesus did. The center of it is humility. And that's how we find reconciliation. There's nothing wrong with conflict if we go into it with humility saying, I might be wrong, but I love you so much. I'm gonna engage in as iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another. I believe God put you in my life to strengthen me. And the suffering it's gonna take to go through this conflict, I hate it. But I believe that on the other side of this, if we do it both with humility God's actually going to bring us closer together. And the most beautiful thing is we're going to be an example to the world of a whole other way. Because we live in a world right now that is very unforgiving. Our woke culture, they don't forgive anything you've ever done. They look back at your history and they find one thing you said that was dumb. They're like, oh, you're out of the club. But we live in a world, and as Christians, we live in a world filled with grace where we forgive and we forgive each other's shortcomings. And we say, I'm, yeah, I don't agree with the evil you're approving of, but I'm sure there's some evil things over here I'm approving of. And we're all falling short of the glory of God. But thank, praise be to God through him. We've been reconciled to God. And that cross is the central thing we rally around. And that's how we find peace. We humble ourselves at the foot of the cross together with those that we're in conflict with as best as we can. It's not always gonna be possible to find reconciliation, but as best as it's in your power, Seek that reconciliation and seek unity of the Spirit. You guys receive that? All right, man, I'm believing God's going to bring some reconciliation even this week in your lives. So, Lord, we thank you this morning for the gift of Jesus on the cross. He came and he reconciled us to God, the one who's ultimately right. He humbled himself, made himself obedient to death, and that death brought us salvation. So we thank you for that, Lord. I pray for those this morning, man, whatever the conflict is they're having with their son or their daughter or their husband or their spouse or their in-laws, I pray, Lord, that you would give us supernatural wisdom in how to deal with that conflict. I don't, let us not run from conflict, but let us say, God, this is an opportunity for you to make me into who I want to be. So I don't want this conflict, but I'm going to go in seeking peace and seeking reconciliation. And I believe at the, with the cross at the center of it, with Jesus at the center, I'm going to find that. If you're here this morning and you do not have your relationship right with Jesus, you already know who you are as I've been speaking. Uh, you know who you are. I'm gonna say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer, God is gonna come and he's gonna forgive your sins. He's gonna transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with him, an eternal address with him in eternity. Let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, you've taken the first step in the kingdom of God. We'd like to give you some resources on the way out to do it again. Real quick, uh, I send out a Monday email. Some of you guys are already subscribed to it, but if you're not, it's short, super short Monday email, and it's got access to my podcast I do with my dad and stuff. If you want to sign up for that, just uh, scan this uh, QR code. It'll pop up a little screen. Put your email address in there and hit submit, and you will be signed up. You guys have got ice cream on the way out under the pavilion. You are dismissed. Be blessed. Stay cool out there. Have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.